Well, thanks, everyone. Um, you know, to me, it's shocking that how rarely we're still talking about the role of humans in AI. Thankfully, you and your colleagues at Stanford have been looking at this for a long time. Um, I thought maybe what would be helpful for the audience to do a level set is just explain what you all mean by human-centered AI and some of the work that you all have been doing. You know, briefly share with everyone because it's, it's some pretty important and incredible work. Great. Thanks for having me here at DLD again. Um, so human-centered AI. We started an institute with this name almost six years ago in anticipation of the moment that we're in. You know, we didn't have chat GPT and we didn't have quite as large models at that time, but it was clear to us already by 2018 or so that this technology finally was really going to be embedded in all of society over time. It was starting to work. We were seeing all the large companies putting it in there, even if the public was not aware of it. And although there's many great applications of AI, which I think probably half the panels here you can learn about with people saying, hey, it's going to do this, it's going to do that. And I agree, it's going to change our, our health, it's going to change our education, it's going to change government. Um, but we also need to make sure that we guide it in a positive way because it won't end up being good by itself. So that's why you know I had that term AI for good isn't good enough because you can have good intentions but that's not enough. You actually have to have the right way of thinking how to build these systems. And so one thing when I think about what human-centered AI is, it's about who do you involve in the process of developing AI. Because AI systems are a little different than traditional software in that they often have side effects beyond the direct user. So over time, we as an industry have embraced a technique called user-centered design and this is something that's you know, uh, been going on for 50 years, and I would say it's only about the last 15 or 20 years that mainstream industry has, has embraced us. So now you would never think of really creating a product without involving users and testing with them and iterating. But you know, when I started in the field 30 years ago, that was still a fight. Well, now we're there, and I'm ready to say, well, that's not enough, because these systems often have impact beyond that direct user you as developers or designers need to increase the lens of who you're talking to when you develop AI systems. So I like to say you need user-centered design, but you also need to go up to a level of what I call community-centered design. So think about what are other stakeholders who may not be direct users. You know, whether it's in criminal sentencing where we might just think of the judge who's looking at a system, but it actually affects the people who are accused, their families, their lawyers, or even victims or if we're talking about health, where it might be a doctor using a system to make a decision about whether you're gonna get a treatment versus I. We need to increase who we're uh, talking to there. So community-centered design is a technique that broadens that scope, and it may even increase the business in terms of who you might think is a user in the end case. And then finally, if your AI system becomes ubiquitous, think of things like Facebook, it can start to have societal level effects. And so we want to be able to predict what negative effects might occur and try to mediate those early on so that we're not taken by surprise when it's too late. Now, if you hear this, you should think that sounds pretty hard. And in fact, it is hard. And it's especially hard for technologists who have no training on how to think about things at this community or society level. And so another in change about human-centered AI is not just who we involve in that process, but is also who's on the team creating it. So we need AI specialists and technologists, but we need designers, we need social scientists, we need humanists, and those different perspectives are gonna allow us to find some of those issues early on rather than wait till you're ready to release something and say, hey, is it okay to release? Because guess what, that will always get released because by then the money's on the line. So we're a couple years post chat GPT and I wanna use the next few minutes to, to kind of do a check-in on where are we in terms of going towards those goals? Because my sense is in terms of what's actually shipping and in wide use and what's getting attention and what's getting investment um, is that we're not actually doing that great when it comes to making this benefit humanity. Um, and I think that one piece that you didn't necessarily um, explicitly say but certainly is implied is you know, also who are we building these systems for? 
Um, and my sense is so far, we're mostly building them for the people who've benefited from most other advances in technology. Yes, I think we will see um, education and healthcare globally especially, benefit from the increase in knowledge that's out there, but we're also seeing the insurance companies, you know, use these systems to figure out how to deny care more effectively. And to your point, you know, we have sentencing systems being built that aren't necessarily doing it. How, if you had to give a grade, what would the grade be that you would give to uh, somebody comes in, turns in a paper, here's, here's how I've implemented AI. Yeah. What grade do you give them? I'd probably give a B minus, but I'm at Stanford and the grades are quite high. So for some of you, that might be a C or a D. Um, trust me, you give a B minus and the Stanford kid's in your office. So here we go. Um, so one is whenever I hear about this term democratizing, it's such a great term, people love to use it. And they say, oh, AI is going to democratize education or democratize healthcare. I say, that sounds good. Again, that's like, that's a good goal. But it won't happen by itself. Technologies, as you have said, new technologies always gone to the rich and well educated. And that's what's happening with this technology. And it will, unless you are very focused on saying, hey, I want to make sure that this is diffused equally or to this segment of the population. So again, AI for good is not good enough. You actually have to really make sure that's a goal and you're going to get the resources from whether it's government, nonprofit or for profit to go do it. But it won't happen by itself or at least not in the time frame where you would want to help people get an equal leg up. It will happen much later. And one of the issues that we haven't explicitly talked about but is certainly underlying this is a lot of these large language models, really all of them are trained on kind of what's gotten written and published on the internet, which has so many biases in and of itself. It's predominantly English and other Western languages. Um, all sorts of other biases are replete within it. Um, Again, are we seeing much movement towards effectively correcting for this bias, or is it, as we might worry, just sort of becoming further institutionalized and further built into the core of it, where it gets harder and harder to identify? Yeah, I mean, that's a really interesting question. Bias comes because people are biased, and so a lot of the data out there has bias. Uh, but that's like a pretty hot field in terms of algorithmically trying to adjust it. The harder part is kind of almost more philosophical. What is the right bias that is okay? That's a little harder. And so in some of those systems, for obvious things, I think there's been a lot of progress there. I think there's bigger questions though that you got at a little bit in your question, which is this data on the internet that trains these large models is primarily Western data, often English data, and it actually embeds Western cultural values. And that might be fine for us in San Francisco and in Munich, but if you're coming from South Korea or South America or South Sudan, that's not necessarily the values you're gonna want there. So how do we make sure that these models that everyone's society is gonna build all of their societal infrastructure on properly encodes values and beliefs that are appropriate? Right now we can't even tell because the models are mainly coming from four or five places, mainly in North America. The data, even in the ones that are open source, they're not open source, they're just open weights. We don't know what data went in, okay? So we can't even understand what happens with different data to understand what happens. So academics, nonprofits, government are at a really uh, disadvantage to even understand these questions. And so this really begs the question of, how do we make sure that academia and nonprofits can still be in the game of AI right now? Because right now the resources needed to build large models, not even at the largest sense, we're talking tens or hundreds of millions of dollars. And so it's gonna take really a collaboration between some key universities and others to really still be able to play in the game at that scale. And we need to do this. Otherwise we don't even understand why these work the way they do. The companies actually don't understand, and when they will, they have incentive to not share that. They're not really publishing research on the deepest questions anymore because now profit, it's proprietary, and they're careful. So we need to make sure that we have this other sector that is still able to understand and make 
uh, change if we're going to rely on this for society. That's not to say we don't want these companies. Yes, we need what they're doing. They're at the leading edge. They're going to produce the products. But we also need this other sector that understands it, publishes on it, and produces the students that are going to be the ones building this in the private sector down the line. And how concerned are you that, you know, it's a predominantly male-dominated field, a predominantly white field, predominantly, uh, you know, a lot of different characteristics. Are they bringing the right people in the room? They're clearly not in the room by their employment, you know, numbers. They don't magically appear in the room. Are they doing enough to get more voices in the room? And how worried are you that we're actually moving backwards rather than forwards, given what we've heard from Meta and other companies in recent weeks? Yeah, so, you know, when I say we need teams that are composed of these different backgrounds, some of that is just purely what area of knowledge they have, but also diversity of life experiences is really important. You know, many of you have uh, read about the Gender Shades Project where, you know, they had these models for facial detection that just did not work for people of color, especially black women. If those teams had any diversity on them, those models never even would have gotten out. They would have found the problems and they would have fixed it. It wasn't rocket science. So many problems that we've seen by having the right diversity on those teams could avoid some of these problems. It's not like these companies are trying to make a mistake. It costs them money to mess up. They don't want to do this. So we do need diversity of skills and also life experiences. But I have to say, as someone who's done PhD admissions, I ran a committee at Stanford for five years, this has been a hard problem. The number, for example, of just women graduating from a bachelor's degree in computer science in the United States has been kind of stuck around 20% for over 20 years. You know, it might be 22% now. And then that leads to who goes into those top PhD programs, which leads to who are those employees in these elite companies, whether it's OpenAI, Apple, Google, or Microsoft. So it is a problem. And given, at least I'm talking mainly from a US context, Supreme Court rulings where you can't even look at race in admissions, the numbers are going to drop considerably. And we could talk about the problems for way longer than we have, but I want to use the remaining time to talk about how can we take where we're at and get better? What are a couple of your recommendations? What are some of the things that these tech companies should be doing, could be doing? Where should people that care about these issues put their energy best to try and make that happen as opposed to hand-wringing. Yeah. So the good news is I actually think a lot of companies do care about this. So for example, at HAI, we have a, a, a pretty healthy industrial affiliates program. They pay a lot of money to be part of it. Part of that is access to our faculty and graduate students. But when I talk to a lot of the executives, it's they want to do AI right. They want responsible AI. They don't know how to do it. So part of the role for us in academia is trying to come up with the ways and test these ways and get case studies so that companies could see the right way to do it. So the good news is I actually think it's not like these people are all evil. People want to do the right thing. They just don't know the right way to do it. So there is interest in doing it. But I think we need to be careful of not being burned by past experience on how to try these things and throwing the baby out with the bathwater. So a lot of these companies have had trust and safety teams, originally really for computer security and privacy, but they kind of expanded that to look at AI harms. And in a lot of cases, they weren't really successful, especially if you look at a place like Meta, where these teams had an inability to stop bad products from being released. And I think part of that problem wasn't that they didn't have the right people, but it was just the composition of the teams uh, were mainly folks in that area, and it was too late. Those people needed to be embedded in the actual product teams where their social capital can actually have influence on what is being built much earlier on. So I think that would be a big thing, is not to think, oh, that didn't work, so don't hire those people, and instead think, how do I put those people on the teams that are actually building these systems earlier in the process. And talk about where you are taking your work at Stanford and, and the teams. I know you just brought someone new on board. And where are you putting some of your investments in terms of what are the next challenges uh, that you think uh, need exploration and you feel like can make a difference? Yeah, I mean, 
So first of all, although deep learning has gotten us really far, I mean, the last 10, 11 years has been this deep learning revolution and we've gotten really far. We don't believe that's the be all end all algorithm for intelligent systems. So we also invest some of our research funds at Stanford in neuroscience because the human brain is still the most complex device in the known universe. And we think we can still learn from that for new algorithms as well as using AI to help us understand the brain. So that's one area. Other areas like common sense reasoning, uh, as you alluded to, we just hired Ye Jin Choi from uh, University of Washington. She's one of the top people in the world in this area. And so, you know, that's another thing for us is to find who are the superstars, whether they're at Stanford or elsewhere, try to bring them to Stanford HAI so that we have this team of the top people who are still able to contribute in this. Awesome. Well, I'd love to keep chatting. Uh, I hope this conversation will continue. Uh, we are out of time. If you're interested in AI stuff and these kinds of discussions we're having, I do a daily newsletter for Axios. You can go to aiplus.axios.com. It's free. I'll be in your inbox every day. And thank you, James. Thank you.